investor friends, I'm Michelle Markey and today I'm going to share the only habits that you need to know in order to be happy and successful in life according to the greatest of all time investor Warren Buffett who talked about the financial future of American youth at the 1999 Nebraska Forum and if you want a better financial future for yourself I hope you'll consider liking and subscribing to my video and YouTube channel because I believe by studying Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger that we can be not only better investors but that that Buffett's words have the power to transform our entire lives, so I hope you enjoy. And allow me to preface Buffett's first bit in asking you to imagine yourself as a startup business where you're looking to raise seed capital so that you can generate more money in the future and what you set out to do. And how much would you be willing to sell your ability to generate future cash flows and earnings by selling an equity stake in your earnings power right now? And you can think of this sort of as like our parents giving us financial support when we go to college and then when we graduate, we can make more money. And and then imagine giving your parents a 10% royalty on all of your future earnings power for the rest of your life. How would you feel about that in considering what Buffett talks about next? But I'd like you to think about this for just a second. If as we walked out of here today, I said I would like to buy 10% of your financial future. I was going to write you a check today and from this day forth, you were going to give me 10% of everything you earned. Uh, how much would you want to charge me for that? I'm going to buy one tenth of you. And uh, I may take the low bid, incidentally, so be careful what you uh, <laughs> write down. Well, I think if you thought about that a little while, as you, you can contemplate that for a few minutes. You know, you're going to get a check from me today, and you can do anything you want with the money, but from this day forth, you have to give me 10% of what you earn. I think it would be very foolish of you, any of you, if you asked for less than, say, $50,000. Now, it's going to be a few years before you're out earning money, and so I've got a few years of dead money there. But then I would start getting this royalty on you as you went along. So I really think that if you thought about it, most of you would want a fair amount more than that, and I think you'd be right. Uh, fortunately, I didn't make this deal with anybody when I started out, so and nobody's got a 10% royalty on me. But I think that 50000 would sort of be the absolute minimum. And if you think about that, that means that right today, you are worth 500000 because if 10% of you is worth 50000 in cash today, your potential is worth a minimum on a 100% basis of $500,000. That is the big financial asset you've got. It's way more important what you do with that $500,000 asset that you own today than whether you decide to buy stocks or bonds or whether you put your money in a mutual fund or pick your own stocks or anything of that sort. The biggest financial asset that you have going for you by miles is the value of your own earning power over the years. So that's really what you should focus on. If you're focusing on your financial future, that means you should focus on you. Because whether your 10% is worth 50,000 or 100,000 or 300,000, which would be 500,000 or a million or 3 million for all of you, whether it turns out to be one or the other is really dependent in a very large part on what you do in the next few years. All of you in this room have the brains to do extremely well in life. You've all got the energy to do extremely well in life. And then the question is, how do you apply it? If you've got a 200 horsepower motor, do you get 200 horsepower out of it? Do you get your full potential or do you get 100 horsepower or 50 horsepower? Now there's two things that can hold you back in getting the full horsepower out of your, your engine, whatever it may be. All of you have big enough engines. And one of those is a lack of education, but that probably isn't gonna happen to very many people in this room. If you did have a lack of education, if you didn't, if you didn't have a chance to get a decent education in life, it wouldn't make any difference what that potential was because you'd never unlock it. But the second most important thing, and equally as important, is in terms of the habits that you develop, in terms of what you do with yourself. When we hire people, we look for three qualities. We look for integrity, we look for intelligence, and we look for energy. But if they don't have the first one, integrity, the other two will kill you. Because if you're hiring somebody without integrity, you really want them to be dumb and lazy, don't you? I mean, you know, the last thing in the world you want for them is to be smart and energetic. So, Smart and energetic only goes with integrity. You know, you make your own decision on that. You can't change your IQ or how far you can throw a football or how high you can jump or the color of your hair very easily. But you can elect to have integrity that matches anybody else's. And if you match that with intelligence which you have and energy which you have, you will get an extraordinary result and you'd be very foolish to sell me 10% of yourself for 50000 On the other hand, if you don't match it with that, your potential will, in a significant part, go unused. And I'll give you a little simple test to apply in terms of thinking about the kind of habits you want to develop. Because you can have any habits you want to be. You can be 
You can be lazy, you can be prompt, you can be, you can be late, you can be honest, you can cut corners. I mean, you have all these choices, and those are choices for you to make. Nobody else is going to make them for you. And I would suggest that you play this little game with me, too. Think about the person you would most like to be in life. Maybe it's one of your contemporaries, maybe it's somebody a little older, but pick out the person you admire the most, the person that you'd change places with if you could. And then write down why you admire them. Just put it on a piece of paper. And then figure out the person that you would least like to change places with. Who really turns you off? Who do you find repulsive? And list the reasons why that person turns you off so much. And put those down on the other side of the paper. And then look at that list. And you'll find that everything on the left-hand side, what you admire in other people, the qualities they bring to life, cheerfulness, you know, generosity, all kinds of things. You'll find those are things you can do yourself. It's very simple. You gotta apply yourself, but the habits you form in doing that early on will carry you through life. And on the other hand, you'll find that the things that make people repulsive, selfishness, obnoxiousness, all these things, egotism, are things that no one has to have. If you find those in yourself, you can get rid of them as long as you get rid of them early. So all I suggest is that you write, you write down a list of what, what you admire, what you find contemptible, and decide that you know the ones on the admired side are, are ones you're going to acquire for yourself. And if you do that when you're young, it'll carry you through the rest of your life. This doesn't work if you do it when you're 50 or 60. By then, the habits are too well formed. But if you do it early, behavior becomes, becomes a habit. So if you do that two or three years from now, if you go through the same exercise, you'll find out that the person you admire the most is yourself. That can be a little dangerous under some circumstances, but, it, uh, uh, but it's, not a, it's not a bad thing. I mean, you want to be somebody you like. And you don't want to be somebody that you that you dislike. And and form those habits early. You basically can't miss. Now I'll give you one other small piece of advice that's just a corollary on this, and then we'll get to your questions. And and that is, as a general matter, as a one piece of specific finance fin, uh, financial advice, I would say, you know, avoid credit cards. Just forget about them. We're in various businesses that issue credit cards. The American public loves credit cards. But if you start revolving debt on credit cards, you're going to be paying 18 or 20 percent. And you can't make progress in your financial life going around borrowing money at 18 or 20 percent. You can make a lot of money by lending it out at 18 or 20 percent over time. I, you know, if you can find anybody that's good that uh, will borrow from you. But you don't want to be on the side of the equation that's always behind in life. You know, I was lucky. I'd saved about $10,000 by the time I got out of school. That $10,000 was really worth millions I might have earned later on because after you get a family and everything, the, the expenses roll in. But, but those were my tools to work with, but it was only because I was ahead of the game. If you're behind the game by $10,000 at some point and paying 18 or 20% interest on it, you will never, you know, you'll never get out of it. So the trick, I've got a partner that says, all I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I'll never go there, you know. And... And that's true in financial matters as well. You want to figure out where you don't want to be ahead of time and avoid that. And I get about a dozen letters a day from people who are having terrible problems. And there are two reasons why they have terrible problems. One is a number of them have had health problems of some sort. I mean, they have really been hit by some, or somebody in their family has been hit by some kind of catastrophic illness. And that is, a, you know, it's a terrible thing to happen to any family. And they get in, they run up bills they can't pay. And, and really only society can solve that one in terms of protecting people against that. It, that's just plain bad luck. But the other one is from people who run up credit card debt and uh, they're facing bankruptcy or they've been through bankruptcy once before and they owe a whole bunch of money and they can't, they can't even pay the interest, let alone pay any principal. And half of my letters come from people like that, and that, that problem is avoidable. Catastrophic illness is not, but credit card debt is something you bring on yourself, and it's way better, it's way easier to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble financially. And, and uh, I will guarantee if you run a big credit card debt, you will be in trouble probably the rest of your life in terms of uh, your financial situation. On the other hand, if you get ahead of the game, even if it's on a very modest scale, so that money is coming in from investing, and people owe you money or equities owe you ownership, uh, you'll be way ahead of the game compared to paying it, be, always be paying uh, your creditors every month. So my advice to you is if you can't pay for it, don't buy it and get yourself in a position where you can pay for anything. And uh, then we'll be glad to see it at Borsheim's or the Nebraska Furniture Market. <laughs>
only thing that I would add to what Buffett said about credit cards is that you can actually take advantage of credit cards if you're ahead of the financial game and you're able to pay all of your bills on time and in full without owing interest to anybody. And that's how credit cards can actually work in your favor. But if for some reason you're not able to get ahead financially, then maybe it's best to stay away from credit cards like Buffett said. And then someone asked, what's Buffett's advice for people who are entering fields without the biggest salaries? And on that point, I would suggest you ask yourself, how much would you like to earn throughout your entire lifetime of working? And then see what your education level might help you get. Because if you look at a Forbes article in the median lifetime earnings, depending on level of education, you can see a huge range of if you have less than high school education, you might only earn $1.2 million or as much as $4 million if you have a professional degree. And that might not be adjusted for inflation, but it gives you a ballpark idea as well as which field you might want to go in. Because if you go into education, like Buffett talks about the earnings power of teachers, you might only make $2 million in your entire lifetime being a teacher compared to if you went into engineering where you earn almost twice that amount. So listen to what Buffett said. It is true that a market system does not pay as well in some in, in some activities as might seem appropriate for the importance of those activities to society. Just take teaching, for example. I mean, teaching does not pay well. And what could be more important? I mean, I, you know, you've got to be as, as interested in who your, the teachers of your children are as, as who your accountant is or, you know, uh, whatever, or who's winning the heavyweight title of the world or that sort of thing. But it doesn't pay well. And it's a fundamental choice whether you're going to go into something, for many people, it'd be a, it'd be a fundamental choice whether you're going to go into something you love or something to, to try and make a lot of money. I think that generally it pays to go with what you love. I think that it's very hard to find people when they get to be my age who say they're on that they've loved what they've done all their life and feel it was very worthwhile, uh, but they're terribly sad they made that choice because they didn't make a lot of money. I've, I, I don't think anybody's ever ever said that to me, that they wish they'd gone into something else where they were uncomfortable doing it or didn't enjoy it, didn't feel very productive, but made a lot of money. So I don't I don't think you'll find that. So I would go to work in whatever terms you're on. It may turn out that it'll, it'll be more profitable than, than you can think, but almost everybody here will make enough money unless they get some terrible habits along the way, to do reasonably well. And, and doing reasonably well in this country really is is uh, is pretty darn good. I mean, it's not necessary to have huge amounts of money in order to enjoy yourself. I enjoyed myself when I was had my $10,000, and I live in the same house that I lived in when I was making it, when I had about that. I bought it 41 years ago. I liked the house then. I like the house now. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a reasonable job, you'll be eating at McDonald's and I'll be eating at McDonald's. So we're, we're to push on food. I mean, you know, I'll, in fact, I hope it's Dairy Queen, actually. And, may, may, at, um, and if you come to Dairy Queen, you'll see me. And you can order anything on the menu I can order and we'll, we both can afford it. You know, you'll, you'll wear the same clothes I wear. I, I'll pay more for my suits, but as soon as I put them on, they look cheap on me. So we'll, we'll look about the same. And, uh, we'll both live in the same kind of houses. I live in that house from 41 years ago and it, it's warm in winter and it's cool in summer and it's comfortable. And you'll live in a house that's similar. And, and what difference does it make if you have 50 more rooms or, you know, guest houses or all that? It, you know, it'll probably just bring you problems. I mean, you have to worry about the uh, greenskeeper or something when you get through. So I, I have been in the houses of people where the houses are worth, oh, probably 200 times what my house is worth. And I would not be any happier in those houses at all. In fact, I'd, I'd be less happy. I just have one more thing to, to worry about and, you know, the dozens of people around the place and people quitting and people stealing from you and all kinds of things. To hell with it. Yeah. We drive, we'll drive the same kind of car. In fact, you'll probably drive a better car. I drive a car that's about eight years old. I don't know what it's worth now, but it gets me around fine. I mean, I, I'm perfectly happy. We'll, we'll watch, we'll watch the same television, you know. We'll, we'll work on the same computer pretty much. The only difference will be how we travel long distances, you know. I will fly in a plane that's more comfortable than, than flying Southwest Airlines or something, which uh, I've got nothing against. But uh, that's the one real big difference. And other than that, I do what I like every day. I hope you, you'll do what you like every day to do. And uh, I work with nice people. I hope you work with nice people. And that's, there's 24 hours in the day, and those are where the hours go. So great wealth is the tiniest bit different in a real sense than having just a decent a decent income and to trade a decent income and something you love doing and something where you feel worthwhile doing it for huge wealth where you trade off a lot of your principles uh, would be a terrible mistake 
And so Buffett made amazing points about living a frugal life where his own life as a billionaire is not that much different from most people. And you might want to choose wisely in whatever your startup home might be because Buffett chose a house that was about three times as big as most Americans house where his house that he still lives in in Omaha is about 6,500 square feet. So think about that the next time you might be wanting to buy your forever home. And then also if you think about what's a decent salary you need in order to be happy in most states in America. Back in 2010, a psychologist economist named Daniel Kahneman found that in order to be happy, most Americans needed about $75,000 per year. And if you adjust for inflation, that's about $98,000 per year. But then if you actually think about factoring even more inflation and cost of living expenses, I think a more realistic figure was determined by go banking rates that stated about $105,000 per year. And then it might be higher in some places, depending on if you live in California, where you need to have at least $145,000 to be happy, or in New York, where it's $153,000 per year to be happy. So keep all this in mind, where you want to strike a balance between trying to make enough money while also achieving happiness in the community that you live in with the people that you love and care about. There's always some trade-offs to consider and although nothing is perfect, you can try to stack the odds in your favor by trying to get a decent career where you're happy so you're not just a mercenary worker who's only in it for the money while achieving happiness and having the right habits in place so that you lead a successful life. And so if you enjoyed this video or learned something, please like and subscribe and I wish you well on being the best investor you can be. Till next time.